Hello, hello, welcome. Al Sadu, Old Saxon, Old Ways Heathens, Old Germanic and Scandinavians, Old Ways Heathens. This video is about Yule, historical pre Christian heathen Yule. Now, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the World Wide Web. Gobs and gobs and gobs of it. There's more misinformation about Yule than there is accurate information. And this video, we're talking about accurate information. So we have six confirmed facts that I'm going to cover on historical even Yule, but technically I'm going to cover more. Because, you know, outside of these six, I can prove that the Danes did their nine-year sacrifice once every nine years on Yule. I can prove other things like what Yule was actually about, its dating, its length, things like that. So we're going to cover these things in this video. And here are the six points up front that I'm going to cover in the video. And after this slide, we're going to move to proving all six of these points with historical references. So the first is there was gift giving at Yule Symbol. The second, Yule was held on the full moon of Yule Manuther or Yule Moon for all Germanic tribes. And this was usually in mid to late January, but sometimes it was held in early February. That is when historical pre-Christian Yule is, and I'm going to prove that shortly. Historical heathen pre-Christian Yule was three days and three nights, not 12 days and 12 nights. The 12 days of modern Christ Mass is the difference between December 21st and the night before Epiphany, January 5th. Those are the 12 days of the Christ Mass. But even the Codex Regis, the Poetic Edda, states that Yule was three days and three nights. And so do the sagas. The Norse peoples, especially the Swedes, for them Yule was a bloat for the crop planting season. It was absolutely not about the return of the sun. How was Yule celebrated? Bloat was done first, followed by symbol. This was typically done in the first night of Yule, and we see this in Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, pretty much everywhere. All the Germanic tribes did this this way, and there were more similarities between the Germanic tribes than differences. We have a Yule feast in the Icelandic languages, in all the Scandinavian languages, and the Yule feast was the highlight of Yule. It was held on the first night of Yule, often, the first night of Yule was called Yule Eve. Heavy drinking was encouraged, and Yule is a celebration of making it halfway through the harshest cold of the year, and to drink, be merry, and to gift the gods for a good crop in the upcoming summer. Now, the Yule ham might come from the Herverar saga. I, I'm calling this one of my Yule facts. I mean, we have you know, oaths sworn on the bristles of a boar in one saga, but it's not shown anywhere else. This seems to be a local tradition because we have, for example, a Yule bloat in symbol in the saga of Hakan the Good, chapter 16, where they're sacrificing a horse and they're not sacrificing or bloating a boar at all. So let's cover the six facts that there was gift giving at Yule symbol. Now, I'm going to note right out of the gate that, you know, we have a symbol in Beowulf, for example, where there's plenty of gift giving. Uh, my personal favorite symbol in all the sagas is Olaf Saga Tryggvasoner, chapter 35. Uh, you know, we have lots of gift giving and many non Yule symbols. So it appears to me that gift giving and symbol was a normal thing. So it shouldn't surprise us that we do have gift giving and Yule symbols. And I also need to make clear that there is a Yule symbol in Hakan the Good Saga, chapter 16, but gift giving isn't mentioned there. So here's the Saga of St. Olaf, chapter 62. In the winter, Avnid was at the Yule feast with King Olaf, and there he got gifts from him. So there's lots of gift giving in the sagas and symbol. And naturally, on Yule symbols, there's gift giving going on as well. Now, here's the most controversial point in my video, but it shouldn't be controversial. The problem is, is that Asa True and many networks and groups have taught misinformation for so long that now someone comes along and presents the evidence 
And by the way, I'm not the only one doing this. I'm going to show even scholars in Stockholm and Uppsala are doing the same thing that I'm doing. And honestly, I'm following their lead. They're not following me. Uh, so Yule was almost always in January. It was sometimes in early February. It was on the full moon of Yule Manuther or Yule moon. And yes, the Scandinavians had a moon of the year called Yule. And the word moon and the word month are related terms. So moons, months were moons back before the Roman church came along. And, you know, that's why the word month is related to the word moon. And believe it or not, modern Asatru, I, I mean, I, guess I shouldn't say believe it or not, but modern Asatru, all their holidays are on solar dates, solstices, equinoxes, and what they claim to be midway points, which isn't even accurate because Halloween or All Saints Day on November 1st, that's 40 days after an equinox and 50 days before a solstice. So the fact that they don't even get that fact right, that Walpurgis night, um, April 30th and May 1st is once again 40 days after an equinox and 50 days before a solstice. I mean, you know, they don't get the halfway points right either. Um, but modern Asatru does use the sun and only the sun, and it does ignore the moon completely. And when they get mad at me and they say this, I say, well, what holiday do you do on a full moon? And Asatru always has an answer, and they don't. Um, you know, they do Yule on the solstice, which is a solar date. They do Midsummer, which is not even a historical Norse holiday on a solstice. They do their winter finding, a Wiccan phrase, um, not when winter nights was truly done on an equinox, etc. Um, but historical holy days were on full moons, and I'm going to get back to that. But the Chronic in the Mar of Merseburg, chapter 17. Um, and he writes in 1000 AD, and by the way, I get that when Christians and Muslims write about heathens that they're biased. But when they state a blanket fact that Yule was done in January after their Christmas, there's no bias in that statement. If there's bias because they're ripping on heathens and calling them a bunch of savages, we can weed out that bias very, very easily. But when Theodmar Mersberg says this, as I've heard odd stories concerning their ancient midwinter sacrifices, I won't ignore this custom. The middle of their kingdom is called Lera, or Lederin, which is in Denmark, in the region of Sealand. All the people gathered every nine years in January. That's after we celebrated the birth of our Lord, and then they offer to their gods bloats. I mean, there's no heathen bias in that statement. He's stating that on Yule, they do the nine-year sacrifice in Denmark. What bias is there in that statement? None. He states that their midwinter was in January, after we've celebrated the birth of our Lord. And at this time in history, the Roman world is using the Julian calendar. The Roman world used the Julian calendar until October 1582, and the solstice on the Julian calendar is December 25th, and that is why Christmas is on December 25th. Starting in 1582, the solstice then was now on the Gregorian or Gregorian calendar, sorry, I mispronounced, the Gregorian calendar, which was December 21st-ish, okay? Um, so... The reason why Christmas is on was on the solstice is because of Rome and Roman paganism, which I'll get back to. It has nothing to do with even Yule, because the Romans weren't having discussions with Danes and Swedes and Norwegians when they were fighting to establish Christianity as the religion of Rome. The battle was between Roman pagans and Roman Christians. That's where the battle was. It had nothing to do with Scandinavia. End of discussion. But I must point out that Theodmar of Merseburg is of the Greek Orthodox faith, according to scholars. So you must remember the Christ Mass of the Church was on 1225, if you were in the Roman Catholic West. But if you're in the Orthodox Byzantium East, it's on 1-6, January 6th, Epiphany. Now, I personally don't give a flying F-bomb. If Theodmar of Merseburg is saying that Yule in January is after the birth of the Lord, Christmas, of 1225 or 16. It doesn't matter to me because I'm not a Christian. But I do agree that Theodmar Mersberg was a member of the Orthodox Church. He probably did celebrate his Christ Mass when the Orthodox Church celebrated it. And therefore, 
it's later than January 6th, but either way, it doesn't matter because when he's saying Yule lives in January, he's saying it's after the solstice. That's a fact. Now, the world's foremost scholar on Norse holy days and their pre-Christian dating is Dr. Andreas Nordberg, who teaches at Stockholm and Uppsala. And scholars are peer reviewed. Their work is reviewed by other scholars. And when I was in Germany, and I was studying archeology span on location with a Saxon heathen professional archeologist. He told me that even the Germans look to Dr. Andreas Nordberg to understand historical pre-Christian Northman timekeeping. That is how much reputation Dr. Andreas Nordberg has. They don't look to Dr. Jackson Crawford in Boulder, Colorado. They look to a Swedish scholar by the name of Dr. Andreas Nordberg. So, what does Dr. Andreas Nordberg state? He states the pre-Christian Yule feast occurs in the first full moon after the first new moon following the winter solstice, while the disting took place at the third full moon according to the same method of calculation. The study concludes with three appendices and the first on etymological issues concerning the words Yule and Hokanote. Now, I'm constantly shocked that Ostertrum never discusses a Yule moon, Yule Manuther, and they never discuss the term Hokanote. But this video, we're going to discuss these terms because we want to be historically accurate. So, here is a screenshot because you can read Dr. Andreas Nordberg for free on academia.edu. And don't worry, you don't have to learn Swedish. He has a one-page introduction in English, which this is a screenshot of. And there is a 20-page summary of his Swedish book, a 20-page English summary at the end of this book. Just read the English summary. I'd rather you read 20 pages in English than try to, to clobber your way through 140 pages in Swedish anyways, especially since the summary gets to the point much quicker, presents the information much more condensed, and gets to the point. So go read Dr. Andreas Nordberg for free. Now today, Hoken the Good. He's important, and for you guys who became heathens from watching the TV show Vikings, you're going to like this part of the video, because Hoken the Good is the son of Harold Fairhair, the guy in Vikings who wants to be king of all Norway, who is the actual historical first king of all Norway. And Hoken the Good, his son, the son of Fair Harold Fairhair, is the reason why Christmas is called Yule in all of Scandinavia today. Why? Because when finally... Unfortunately, the kings went Kaisers, Roman Caesars, not because the word king comes from kin, a family or a clan head. Now, under Christianity, it's like a Kaiser or a Caesar or a czar, one who rules by divine right. And once the Germanic peoples accepted kings in the manner of Christendom, you have a problem because once you have a Christian king, he's going to force all the heathens into Christianity. And that's precisely what happened. We even have a saga about how King Hokan the Good moved Yule from Hokanote, Yule from Hokanote, the full moon of Yule moon, to be on the night of the solstice, December the 25th, as part of forced Christianization. So today the Scandinavians call Easter Pasch because they didn't have a goddess named Easter. They call Christmas Yule because of Hokan the Good. Hokan the Good was so influential that the Icelanders, the Swedes, and the Danes, once they accepted Christ, followed the first Christian king of all Norway and his Christianization policy. He was the standard. He set the standard. Why did he set a standard? He set the standard because he was such a great Christian king. We had to write a saga about this great Christian king and how he forced Christianity by bringing it to Norway through force, right? Here's the saga of Hakan the Good. I'm going to read right from it, and I'm going to highlight the important sections of it in yellow. King Hakan the Good was a good Christian when he came to Norway. Okay, what, he came to Norway? Yeah, because as a child, he went to England. Why did he go to England? Because that's where all the educated monks were. So he went off to the great monks in England, and he, he really became a Christian expert. And when his brother, an older son of King Harold Fairhair, dies, he gets to become king. His brother was heathen. The second one is Christian. So he then returns 
to Norway to be king. And he finds that there's heathens in Norway doing heathen bloats. And many great people, as well as the favor of the common people, were to be conciliated. He decides to practice his Christianity in private when he first gets there. He keeps Sundays, he keeps Friday fasts, and some token of the greatest holy days. But then he makes a law that the Feast of Yule will begin at the same time the Christian people held it. So this means that before this law, Yule and the solstice, when Christmas was, were at two different times. And every man under penalty should brew a meal of malt into ale, and therewith keep Yule holy as long as it lasted. Before him, the first sin of Yule was on Hoken Note, that is midwinter night, and Yule was held for three nights. This is the reason why Andreas Norberg wants to describe what Hokanote is in his books. I mean, Asatru never discusses Hokanote. They discuss the solstice, which is following Hokan the Good, the Christian, off a cliff. But we're going to discuss Hokanote in this video because we want a historical pre-Christian heathen religion. Now, this saga continues. It was Hakon's intent, as soon as he had set himself fast, firmly, fast is another way to say firm, he's going to subject the whole land to his power and he's going to introduce Christianity. Nice guy. He went to work first by enticing to Christianity the men who were dearest to him. And many out of friendship to him allowed them to be baptized and even laid aside performing bloat. This is Hokan the Good. Okay? Hoken the Good Saga shows that it's very unheathen and Christian to venerate Yule on the solstice in the manner of a Christian king trying to stamp out heathenry. I'm going to be blunt. I hear so many people saying all the time, Christians borrowed paganism and brought it into the church. But funny, the sagas say it's the opposite. That they actually decided to enforce Christianity by moving heathenry to when Christians did Christianity. Because this is how they stamped it out. They weren't going to move Christmas to when Yule was. They were going to move Yule to when the church said it should be. Christmas, the solstice. That's how they did it. And by the way, um, Rome, Roman paganism was Saturnalia. And Christmas, December 25th, was established as the date of Christmas by the Roman church in 336 AD. Look it up. It has been on December 25th, since 336 AD. And this is long before Romans were having lots of strong discourse with Scandinavian people. And by the way, there are only 25 million people in Scandinavia today when I look it up online. And just in the northern part of Germany, where Saxony was, there's 26 million people. And in all of Germany today, if I'm to believe online, there's 82 million people. What I'm trying to say is that Scandinavia because it's so cold up there, there's less people living there than in continental Europe. And in the 10th century, French people, for example, who have been Catholics for 700 years aren't going to jump up and down saying, wait, you want us to do heathen Norwegian practices now to help these Scandinavian yahoos come into the church? That's not how Christianity operated. And by the way, Christians did invent their own traditions. Christmas trees started to show up in the late 15th century. Okay, and it has no link to heathen. We have no saga passages of them chopping down trees and bringing them indoors to decorate them. Okay, Christians chop down holy trees. Heathens put blood on them in bloat and leave them standing outdoors. Heathens don't put ornaments on trees in the sagas. They put blood on the trees through bloat. When we read the sagas and we read what Christians do on, or what heathens do on Yule in the sagas, they don't match what Christians do in masses and Protestant services whatsoever. There's Christianity and there's heathenry. They are two different things. Yule and Christmas are two extremely different holidays celebrating two different things and we're on different dates. So, the first night of Yule was on Hoka Note, and it was held for three days and three nights. This is my next point. So the, this slide changed because now I'm saying Yule is three nights historically up at the top. And Hokan the Good died in 961 AD, just to give you some time frame. Okay, now I'm going to quote several other passages showing that Yule is three days and three nights. 
Okay, because Hoken the Good is a Snorri passage, Heim Skringla is a Snorri passage. So you have another Snorri passage like um, Magnus the Blind, chapter 6, that talks about you will leave. And King Harold comes to Borgen and brings his ships, etc. But I'm going to skip. He had foot traps forged and cast over Yon's bolts. And Yule was kept holy for three days when no work was done. So there's no work that's done during the three days of Yule, and Yule is three days. One heathen group that I know of says we do the epic method. We, we take the Codex Regis first because it's older than Snorri. So the Poetic Edda, or the Codex Regis, states that Yule was three days and three nights. Um, I'm not going to quote the whole passage because it's freaking long. But look it up. The Poetic Edda, right here, here's the name. The Lay of Helgi, the son of Hjorvarth, chapter 4. Okay, so to summarize this passage, Haven came home alone on the evening of Yule after a stay of three days, a battle commenced. So a duel is put off in this Lay of Helgi passage in the Poetic Edda. A duel between two people is put off because there's no bloodshed during Yule. Yule is kept holy for three days. No work was done, according to the last saga passage. And this passage, Yule's too holy to desecrate with bloodshed. So I can add in some other bullet points of things that we know about Yule. There's no bloodshed. There is no work. You get to have three days and three nights off from doing work. So our fourth lesson about Yule, it's a bloat for the crop planting season. Ynglinga Saga chapter 8 says Odin established the same law in his land that had been enforced in Azaland. On winter day or the first day of winter, there would be a bloat for a good year. In the middle of winter for a good crop. <clears throat> and the third bloat should be on summer day, a victory bloat. So how did heathen timekeeping work? In my winter nights video, I listed a bunch of passages that proved, and even one of them, Bede, came out and said, you know, they begin winter on a full moon. And he just comes out and says it. So winter day is on the full moon of House Manuther, which is why winter nights is also called a house bloat, though it's called the Disa bloat in Iceland. So if you remember the lessons and those passages from that video. So winter nights is on a full moon and three full moons later is the middle of winter. And three moons after the middle of winter is the first day of summer, Sigurbloat. So midwinter or Hokanote is three full moons after winter nights and it's three full moons before Sigurbloat. That is the middle of winter. And again, the word moon and the word month are related words. The average farmer knew about when the solstice was, but they could not just look at the sun and determine the exact date of the solstice. They knew about, and we have ancient places built, like Stonehenge, which Germanic tribes didn't build that, but we do have some ancient stone monuments built that shows that they knew the exact date of the solstice centuries prior. But the average common, common farmer did not. But one thing there was no arguing is everyone can look at a moon and determine when the crescent switch sides when, when you have a new moon, okay? And they can determine when a moon is full by looking at it. There's no arguing it. And this is why the historical pre-Christian heathen calendar was lunisolar. In other words, they used the solstice to determine when a 13th moon was going to be added to their year. But the months were moons, which is why the word month comes from the word moon. It's called a month, not a sunth. So it's almost a shame that I have to explain that because a lot of people have no idea that, you know, like modern September, it doesn't match a moon. At least most years it doesn't. On a rare occasion it does. And the average lunar cycle is 29 and a half days. And that's even um, abbreviated. You know, it's not exactly 29 and a half days. It's close to being 29 and a half days. So, you know, you can't fit seven-day increments in a solar calendar or a lunar calendar. You can't. And Germanic peoples didn't have a seven-day week, nor did they have some Semitic um, story of the creation of the world where some all-powerful being created in six days and rested on a seventh. You know, that, that's Judaism and the Judeo-Christian, which has Semitic origins far older than even the Bible. Germanic heathens had days of the moon, not days of the week. And we see that in the sagas. So 
if Yule is a bloat for a crop planting season, where did all this bullshit teaching that Yule is about the return of the sun? And there's pun intended there because you have a sun, S-U-N, and there's a birth of Jesus, the sun, S-O-N. Um, I see way more borrowing of Christianity today in Asatru than I see actual heathen practice in Asatru. And people get mad when I say this. And I don't mean to tell people what to do. I mean, if you want to continue Christianity, who am I to say that you can't? I'm a teacher of this is historical, this is not. And people are going to get mad. But I'm just going to come out and say this. Yes, the Roman pagans and the Roman Christians fought. And to help get Roman pagans into the church, the Roman church chose the solstice, the date of Roman Saturnalia in 336 AD to be the date of Christ Mass. This has absolutely nothing to do with Scandinavian heathenry or Scandinavian or Germanic people. Because at this point in time, in 336 AD, Germanic heathens are not in the church. And the church bringing Saturnalia into the church is not bringing Yule into the church. Saturnalia is Saturnalia, Yule is Yule. And what do these Christians say at, at this time period. So I just chose two quotes, but I can choose several hundred. But Augustine says, Hence it is he was born on the day which is the shortest day of our earthly reckoning, the shortest day of the year, and the subsequent days begin to increase in length. He therefore who bent low and lifted up those, who lifted us up chose the shortest day of the year when light begins to increase. This is Christian thought. This is Christian doctrine. Jesus had to have been born on Christmas because Jesus is bringing light into the world and therefore the darkness stops and light comes. Okay, that's Christian thought. And by the way, I can prove right now that the Bible doesn't believe in birthdays. Jewish people did not believe in birthdays. There are two birthdays in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, a pharaoh Egyptian is not a Jew. An Egyptian is a Gentile. A pharaoh has a birthday party where he has a baker killed and allows a cup baker to live. And Joseph, the son of Jacob, had a dream predicting that. That is the only mention of a birthday in the entire Jewish Bible, what Christians call the Old and Irrelevant Testament. In the New Testament, there's one birthday party, but that same birthday party is attested in all four Gospels. Herod Agrippa, and Agrippa is a Greek type name, but Herod is an Idumean, and this is the son of the Herod the Great. But Herod Agrippa, Herod the Great's son, is having a birthday party, and a woman dances so beautifully for him, he offers to give him anything the woman asks, and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. That's Herod's birthday party. So in the Bible, it's very clear that Jews did not have birthdays, and many Orthodox Jews don't celebrate birthdays today. And I can prove as well from heathen writings that heathens didn't have birthdays, because when the Saxons were forcefully converted, the first Christian writing to convert the Saxons took a paragraph to explain what a birthday was, which means the Germanic Saxons did not know what a birthday was. It had to be explained to them in the old Saxon Hellion. So how did they tell age? By winter numbers, which I'll get to a passage that shows that shortly. But let's get back through this borrowing of Christianity, this idea of the sun getting longer. It's Christian in thought. It's not heathen. Because bloat, you will bloat is for a crop planting season that's like six weeks away. Um, so they're bloating for that in preparation for that. Um, but St. Cyrus says the Gentiles usually celebrated the birthday of the sun on December 25th, lighting up lights to mark the solstice. I mean, I've actually had to argue with people that December the 25th was a solstice on the Julian calendar. It's this bad. I've had arguments like having to prove to people that December 25th was a solstice. And it was a solstice during the sagas. And I shouldn't have to argue that, but I do. Um, when Christians became aware of the cult, they consecrated and resolved to sanctify the true birth of Christ on that day. So Christianity is about the birth of the sun and the days getting longer. But Yule was not about Christmas or about the sun getting longer. So people who practice the birth of the sun um, with the solstice and call that Yule, they're not following historical heathen Yule. They're following Christianity in Roman Saturnalia. So I've already mentioned the top part, Yule was three nights historically, but I just want to reiterate again, Yule and Christmas are two extremely different holy days with two different meanings. So let's go to my last two points. I'll be pretty quick. References to Yule, bloats, feasts, and drinking a lot. 
So here's an example. They were six winters old. Okay, to count age, for heathens, they counted how many winters they lived because a new year in the heathen times began with winter nights. So every time you pass a winter night, so if you're born just before winter night starts, you're called the year old almost already because that's just how they did it. Um, I'm not saying it has to make sense for our modern minds, but that's heathen culture. So we have lots of, and I'll have you guys read these passages later, but basically I... I could have mentioned 33 mentions of Yule in one saga alone. Um, there, there's 103 mentions of Yule in Heimskringla alone. Um, there's so many passages, and here's some of them, and I encourage you to pause, read through these. Now, these passages all show Yule feasting, Yule drinking, and again, I just picked four for this video, but in my notes, I have a few hundred passages that show that they drank, they, they did Yule for uh, uh, bloat first. You know, you sprinkle the blood on Herg, uh, and a stone altar on trees, on the people, uh, on, on the inside parts of the wine hall. You cook the meat, you eat the meat, and, and then the drinking starts. Uh, you know, you will bloat, you will symbol. Um, and you're allowed to drink a lot. Now, to end this video, we're going to discuss the Yule Boar. Now, I'm going to be blunt. I say that the Yule Boar is a fact, but it's really a fact in a whopping one saga. And by the way, like Hokan the Good, chapter 16, when it shows a Yule bloat, they're sacrificing a horse there. Or not sacrificing. They're, they're giving the blood of the horse to the gods because this is heathen. Let's, let's, we'll, buy, we'll, we'll knock out the bias of Christian and Muslim sources here who imply that heathen sacrifice like biblical Jewish sacrifice in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the Bible, that they wasted animals. Um, the sagas show that they they cooked the meat and they kept the skins for clothing for winter to keep warm, right? To survive. They cooked the meat to eat it and they gave the blood to the gods, which is why it's called bloat. So, you know, that's what you see in Hokan the Good chapter 16. They sacrifice the blood but the blood is going to the gods, but the meat is eaten and the, the, the hides are saved because it's valuable. Um, so here's a saga passage that has a Yule boar. And let's just start here. It was a custom to sacrifice this boar at the sacrifice of the herd. And on Yule, the boar of the herd was led into the hall. And then men put the hands on the bristles and laid solemn vows. This is found only in the Herverar saga. So everyone's saying that Yule Ham, that they this is a straight steal from one passage in, there's like 700 sagas out there. I'm so tired of Asatruar saying we have like no evidence. I mean, there's 103 message, uh, passages of Yule alone in Heimskringla. Okay, there's like 700 poems and sagas out there. We have a ton of information. The problem is, is Asatruar, for the most part, don't study. So they don't know how much information there is out there. We have hundreds of passages on Yule and Winter Nights in the sagas. Hundreds. That's hundreds, plural. 103 times, just in Heimskringla alone, for Yule. We've got lots of information on it. We do. Um, the people that say we don't have much are the people that haven't studied or, the, or who, their study hasn't extended past Google or Bing or Yahoo search engines. But the Yule Boar, it's in one saga. It's there. Um, but we have many other sagas that show that other animals like horses were sacrificed or killed for food. And... No one should be shocked that like German people, like when I go to Germany every year to visit my family, there's there's sausage. OK, yeah, there's so much non-German food in Germany, so much. I mean, it's it's at times it's hard to find knock verse, but there's lots of, of verse, Wiener schnitzel and other worse in Germany. Uh, lots of people like ham and pig meat um, to say that because there's one saga passage that has a Yule boar that the Christmas ham is a direct ripoff from it is a stretch. Um, it's a stretch. Has a church at times, especially early when the Roman Empire wasn't Christian yet, borrow heathen practices? Sure. But we have 
lots and lots and lots of laws once the church is the power where they didn't make any compromise and they kept heathenry outside of the church, like the Lex Exonum says, all heathenry needs to die and you Saxons who come into the church, you need to be purely Christian. I mean, these laws, and there's hundreds of laws like these that are very clear. So people jump off cliffs thinking that they're going to find a Christmas tree or an Easter egg in the Norse sagas because they're not there. You know, someone today, literally today, argue with me, well, a maypole has to be Scandinavian. Why? Because it's not in the Bible. Well, then why can't I argue that a maypole has to be American because it's not in the Bible? I mean, it's pretty easy to prove that poles are venerated all over the world, not just in Scandinavia. And it's very easy to prove that May celebration started in the church on May 1st, 870 AD, when Walpurga, a saint's bones, were transferred and laid to rest in a church and miracles started. That's when that started, for example. So lots of these things have absolutely nothing to do with heathenry at all. I mean, and every day is a saint's day. You know, I already read a passage in this video where there are three major bloats a year on the first day of winter, midwinter, and the first day of summer. Christians hold mass daily. Heathens did not do bloat daily. Knock it off. Just knock it off. Okay, if you want to do a daily mass, like one of my former bosses, he went to mass every morning. You cannot schedule a meeting with him before 9 a.m. because between 7.30 and 8.30, he was down the street in Catholic mass. You know, there are Catholic mass every day. It's less and less because Catholics are less and less Christian, but, you know, you could go attend a mass daily. Um, and you could in heathen times, but all Christians went to church on Sundays. Um, Heathens did not have a bloat once a week. This is Christian. So visit our website, www.altsidu.com. Um, do add black, uh, black slash blog to get to my blog articles. I have four different Yule blog articles. One that just focuses on Hoke and the Good. Um, so, you know, if you learn better by and you want to read all the, the sources that I put up, um, the more than I showed in this video, check it out. And like and subscribe. And also, I do not have a Patreon page. I'm going to be 100% for free at all times. I'm not going to try to profit off this in any way, shape, or form. My goal is to help you grow and to learn historical pre-Christian heathenry versus modern Christian and Wiccan fluff bunny things. And I shouldn't call it fluff bunny things. Um, Christianity is a religion that I should show respect for, and so is the Wiccan faith. But I do have a hard time with making things up. I'll just be honest. Um, if, if we're getting to the point where you have to make stuff up completely, I'd rather be an atheist. That's me. And that's why I go for a historical religion the old ways. So, hey, like and subscribe. Thank you so much. And check out my other videos. Have a great Yule this year. It is on the full moon of Yule Manuther, January 28th, 2021. Enjoy.